Like anything you do in life, you do it long enough, your strategies for doing it evolve. Equity market investing is no different. And Basan Maheshwari, author of The Thoughtful Investor, has experienced those evolutions over the last 30 years that he's been investing in the stock market. I'm going to ask first an existential question to you and then, you know, focus on your own experiences. There comes a point where equity investors, they can't seem to extend their winning run. So, you know, you might do well for 15, 20 years in your investing career and then you can't do it anymore. Why does that happen? Because the market is always changing every decade. So the flavor of 1980 wouldn't be the flavor of 1990. The flavor of 1990 wouldn't be the flavor of 2000. The flavor of 2000 would never be the flavor of 2010. So let's take the Indian example for a, that consideration. In the mid 80s and the early 70s, the biggest money was made in the Ferra stocks as we used to call them, the Colgate, the HULs, the Nestle, the Britannias. And people who made money from them made a lot of it. And you thought this is the only way of making money in India comes 1990-91-92 suddenly the old economy as we call them ACC and Tata Steel and the auto names the Mahindra Mahindras they start going up and people who have made money buying high quality branded stocks like HULs and Nestle's and Colgate's they do not know whether it's making sense for them to get rid of these high quality brands and buy the metal and the steel names and the cement companies because brands by themselves have high ROE, they have barriers to entry, they have pricing power. Considerations for buying a cement company or a steel company are entirely different. So somebody who's made money in the steel space and the cement space in the early 90s has done it by backing companies with hard assets. Comes 1993-94. Infosys, no assets nothing to do it's just a concept they are a services company what do you do at that time you have made your money buying cement and steel how do you reconcile to buying a company which has no assets of his own so then the new problem starts so somebody else makes money in software he makes money for the six year for the next five six years comes 98 99 2000 the PSU stocks start rallying again from buying companies without assets you are buying companies that are laden with assets and trading cheap in the hope that they would be sold. So guys who made money in the year 98, 99, 2000, 2001 are, are mentally equipped to buying PSU names. And then they can't change in 2003 when mobile telephony comes, retailing comes and real estate comes. Because their mantra for making money is buy something today and the government will disinvest it tomorrow. At this moment, there's a thing to explain there's a huge difference between disinvestment and privatization disinvestment is something that serves no purpose just creates additional floating stock in the market it's the privatization of government companies that really makes money for shareholders hindustan zinc as i keep saying went from 30 rupees to 1000 so come back to it so mobile telephony infrastructure comes 2008 2009 the big money was made buying page industries iShare motors sun pharma Nothing to do with infrastructure, nothing to do with real estate. Again, the market has changed. You're buying a licensee company, a page industries, maybe Jubilant Foodworks also. Then comes 2013, 14, 15, where company stocks like Greer Finance and Bajaj Finance and the financial names start going up. In between, there is an HDFC bank, which grows from the year 1996 till the current times. But HDFC Bank was never known for creating astronomical return for its shareholders. So the market keeps changing, it keeps evolving. Like we shared this example in the, till 2008, the US market saw money being made from financial stocks. And post 2008, the fang and the bat, where there was no financial stocks, there was no hard assets to back them. So with every change in the market, investors are mentally wired to focus on things that have made money for them rather than try and experiment and test. You will test and experiment when you have very little to lose. But when once when you have lots of money at your disposable, at your disposal, then it's very difficult to actually go out and try something new. And so, that's why the winning streak beyond a point doesn't extend itself. Unless, of course, you basically have mastered the art of looking for the new, identifying the new and betting on new. So is that the secret to making big money in the equity markets? The best thing is to look at the new highs. They will tell you there is something happening there. 
Is Warren Buffett a great investor or a great entrepreneur? Great entrepreneur. If you just remove the leverage part to it, which is the float, because he gets money up front and invests it back into the companies he buys, I don't think Buffett has even generated 10% return. Just that he started so early and he's living a very long life. Two things that are not in your control. You didn't start at 11. I didn't start at the age of 11. We don't know whether we're going to live till the age of 90, 91, 92. So the two things that separate him was a starting point and the ending point. Not in our hands. Buffett is basically an improvised version of a bank. So it's got zero cost money, float, which we call it. And then he tries and gets 8 to 10% CAGR on that money. Which means he's creating a spread of 8% on borrowed money. And you might not call it borrowed because the money that he has, it has his disposal. But tomorrow he might have to play some, pay back some claims. So because of that, I think the business model of Buffett has been to get free money from somewhere, use it to buy stocks. And that's why Buffett would never buy something which is even 1% higher on the risk side. So Buffett's most of his purchases have been on credit card companies, American Express, for example. He would buy banking names of Wells Fargo. He would buy most of the retailing names, most of the consumer names because he wants to be stable and safe. It's not his money. It's money borrowed from somewhere else. Scuttlebutt, a term that uh, one comes across and you wonder what does it mean? What is it? Scuttlebutt basically means to figure out a new trend at the start of a trend. So if you're doing scuttlebutt, it means going out and asking your friends whether they're using the latest shampoo of a company that you would like to buy shares of. But more often than not, it's the very initial phase of figuring out what is supposed to work on a mass scale. Scuttlebutt, I mean, if you look at it from an economics point of view, the sample size is thoroughly irrelevant and it doesn't matter too much, but one investor tried doing this in the mid 50s, Philip Fisher, and that is how the theory came into vogue. But I don't think it actually helps you in the long run because the sample size that you're looking for is very small. It just helps you build conviction that what you have bought is good enough. What you buy, is it more important than when you buy? I mean, irrespective of when you bought a DHF, DHFL, it went to zero. Irrespective of when you bought a Yes Bank, it still fell 95%. Irrespective of when you bought a Unitech, it still fell 100%. Irrespective of when you bought these shady software names, they still fell 100%. Irrespective of when you bought an HDFC bank, you're still making money. Irrespective of when you bought a Nestle, you're still in the game. So what you buy, the longer the length of your holding period, the greater the significance of what you buy. Investing strategies, evolution. Uh, Basan Maheshwari has had uh, knocks and successes in his 30-year career. But what we've achieved in this conversation is to compress all the wisdoms that he's gained over 30 years and present them to you who's watching.